wanted to break down for you what is actually a really massive game-changing decision that was just made by the uh, National Labor Relations Board under Joe Biden that could actually really change the game in terms of union density in this country. Let me go ahead and put this up on the screen and then I'll explain in detail what all of this means. This is courtesy of More Perfect Union. They say breaking. The National Labor Relations Board has ruled that if bosses commit unfair labor practices in the run-up to a union election, which happens, by the way, guys, all the time, like routinely in a majority of union elections, the bosses commit unfair labor practices. If that happens, then the union election is going to be canceled and the National Labor Relations Board will order the employer to immediately recognize the union and bargain with the union. More Perfect Union adds union busting just got a lot harder. They go on to say now every union campaign has to go to an election to get formal recognition, but bosses use that time to union bust often illegally. Now, if a majority of workers support the union, bosses will have to stop union busting or be forced to negotiate and recognize the union with no election at all. As the chair of the NLRB says, quote, it eliminates incentives for employers to commit unfair labor practices as a way to delay or defeat representation when a majority of workers have shown support for a union. So as it stands prior to this ruling, as you guys likely know, if workers want to organize with a union, it is a massive uphill climb. The very first step is the union will get um, supporters who are interested in joining the union to sign uh, cards. They mm -hmm. sign off basically saying, yes, I'm interested in joining the union. Now, it used to be that if a majority of workers signed those cards, the assumption was, okay, then you're going to be represented by a union and the employer has to bargain with you unless there are some more extraordinary circumstances that would indicate that actually no a majority of workers don't really want to join the union and then it would go to election. So it used to be, and this was called the um, Joy Silk Doctrine, uh, they used to be, it was the presumption that the workers, if there was a majority of cards signed, would form a union. That has been completely upended over decades, and now the presumption is the total opposite. It doesn't matter how many workers sign the card, it's going to an election, and all of that time between when the cards are signed and when the election happens, employers routinely engage in illegal, unfair labor practices and overt union busting. So this ruling is now taking a step part of the way back towards that old method where the presumption was that if majorities of workers want to join a union, then, you know, they have to recognize the union. Mm -hmm. So if the employer then is caught engaging in unfair labor practices, union election is canceled and the, you know, union wins and they have to bargain with them. So this is a huge deal. The backstory here and why this ruling is coming out now is because there is a group of Cemex cement truck drivers who in 2019 narrowly voted against joining the Teamsters. However, during the run-up to that election, Cemex, the company, had committed more than two dozen unfair labor practices that included threatening, surveilling, interrogating workers, hiring security guards to intimidate them, et cetera, et cetera. And so because they had so wildly skewed the results of this election, the National Labor Relations Board is now saying no. Um, the, the, that election is now null and void and you have to recognize this Teamsters union and you have to start bargaining with them. And that logic is now going to be applied across the board. I cannot emphasize to you enough what a huge historic, um, you know, sort of game changing deal this is in terms of workers who want to organize. And of course, Sagar, it comes at a time mm -hmm. of increasing labor militancy, of rising grassroots uh, union uh, movements, and also of near historic high public support for unions as well. So this is really quite extraordinary. Yeah, I was just, I was trying to figure out like why now? Is it also in the context of the UAW strike? Like that's what we had been looking at. That's the one that's looming. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we've actually seen successful resolution of some of these bigger disputes, like UPS, for example, despite posturing. So is it on the heels of that? Like, where does No, it, it really comes straight out of the uh, general counsel, Jennifer, Jennifer Abruzzo, of the National mm. Re Labor Relations Board under Joe Biden, who I think has been extraordinary. I think is one of the best, you know, things that, the, that Joe Biden has done, putting her in this position. She has said for a while that she wants to revisit 
the Joy Silk Road doctrine. And so uh, unions have been waiting and workers have been waiting to see how this all comes down. And as I said, this is almost like a middle of the road path because it doesn't go all the way back to just what you know would be called card check, where if there's a majority of cards signed, that's it, end of story, there's a union, unless the burden is on the uh, boss to prove that no, in reality, there aren't a majority of workers, and then you go to mm -hmm. the election. So it doesn't go all the way back to that. It's kind of a middle of the road. But in comparison to where we are today, it's a huge deal. And so you know, this is a, um, a general counsel at the Na National Labor Relations Board who's been very interested in trying to rebalance the skills and make it much more fair for workers to be able to organize and be able to bargain. And this particular case that ended up before the National Labor Relations Board just gave them the sort of perfect opportunity to revise and update um, the, you know, the approach with regards to when unions are recognized and when the elections have to occur. So I think they were, if I had to say why now, it's because this case provided them with the opportunity yeah, to issue an updated ruling and updated guidance about how this is all supposed to work. That makes sense. Well, then it will likely spawn some more labor actions in the future because people will feel as if they have much more of a cover and it will also change the way the business has to interact yeah. with said unions. Workers will have a lot less fear about like, because as of now, you know, we, we covered the Amazon fight down in Bessemer, Alabama, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of workers in a, a region where there aren't a lot of good jobs, you know, they were fearful, right? They're afraid, like, okay, I've got a job that pays pretty decently, and yeah, I got all these problems with it, and I might like to be part of a union and have that kind of collective power, but I'm afraid. Like, they they might retaliate against me. They might close up shop altogether. They might fire me. All of those things were a real possibility. And in the past, Workers that routinely, I mean, bosses that routinely union, routinely union bust, like Starbucks, like Amazon, like basically all of them, they would get a slap on the wrist. You know, they have to like pay a, a modest fine or post the rules that and the rights that workers have in the workplace. And that would basically be it. So there was no real accountability or no real consequence to work to bosses just overwhelmingly union bust. So yeah, this completely changes the landscape. I mean, I think it'll take some time for workers to really internalize, like, no, actually, I don't have to be so fearful of those consequences. I can actually, if I want to, join a union, be involved in organizing, all of those things. But the way that this rebalances the scales, the way this changes the landscape, we've had years and years and years of union density decline. And even in this past little, um, you know, little stretch over the past year or couple of years, where you've had a lot more activity, you've had a lot more strikes, you've had a lot more union efforts, you've had the Starbucks movement, the Amazon movement, all of that stuff, you still, as a percentage of the workforce, have seen the percentage, like the union density decline. This could actually be the thing that flips that on its head, mm -hmm. that enters a new era of increasingly building worker power. And um, you know, to shift to the other part of this that is really big, you pointed out the Teamsters, the UPS workers um, organized under the Teamsters just scored some major wins in terms of their contract, got a lot of attention. Some of the drivers are going to be making 170 k yes. a year. With benefits. With that, benefits. Yeah. Those are, you that know, but that's, a, that's yeah. a good good wage. And by right. the way, that's not just good for UPS workers. Any driver in the like package delivery industry is probably going to benefit mm -hmm. from this because FedEx, they're going to have to up their game to compete now with UPS. So you're starting to see these big national movements where workers can really tell, hey, if I have a union, I might be able to get a better deal. I, they can see the wins in the games that are occurring here. And we've got another really big one that is coming down the pike that we've been following closely. Go ahead and put this up on the screen. So the United Auto Workers, who of course uh, represent workers at all the big three uh, automakers, they have now overwhelmingly voted to authorize strikes at GM, Ford, and Stellantis. Stellantis is the name of the other uh, big three at this point. The union on Friday said an average of 97% of combined members at the automakers approved the action. However, final votes are still being tallied. Uh, they have a new president at the UAW, a guy named Sean Fain, who ran on being more militant and more representative of the rank and file. He was quoted as saying, the big three is our strike target. And whether or not there is a strike, it's up to Ford, GM, and Stellantis because they know what our priorities are. We have been clear. And the... Um, demands that the union is starting their negotiation with are, you know, they're quite extraordinary. Like they're they're audacious and I personally love to see it. Includes a 46% wage increase to match 
the wage increase that the CEOs of the big three have gotten over the just the past couple of years, restoration of traditional pensions, so not 401k, like defined benefit, this is what you get, and that's the end of the story, cost of living increases, which was something that these workers gave up when they helped to bail out these automakers during the financial crash, and reducing the work week to 32 hours from 40 and increasing retiree benefits. So basically going to a four day work week, something that has been successful in other industries and studies have shown has been pretty successful overall. Um, but that's another, you know, that's a really big deal. So the strike deadline, uh, the, the deadline in terms of contract negotiations is coming here in just the next couple of weeks in mid September. And obviously, if these workers go out on strike, it would be a, a really, really big deal. And whatever contract they are able to secure is also going to be a really big deal, not just for auto workers, but for a lot of different workers across a lot of industries. Yeah, that's actually the most interesting one to me is both about the changes, as you said, about UPS and how that will change the overall package delivery market, especially as yeah. it continues to massively grow. But then also with UAW, that sets the actual tone for as we head into even more automation, electric vehicles. Vehicles. Mm -hmm. That's where actually some of the biggest fights with them are on, right. you know, demanding that uh, X amount be actually made here in the U.S. I think that's the most important thing about helping us be remain resilient as a country to make sure that in any future problem that we actually will be able to control a lot of what we actually need in order to subsist and to live here. And the union is actually a huge part of that. It's interesting because they're the ones really fighting for all of that. If the execs had their way, every single thing would be made in China. They don't even want to make it in Mexico. Right. They want to make it all halfway across the globe in order to save, you know, a penny in order to squeeze even more out of the, the stock price. Yeah, and the UAW has been unhappy with the Biden administration not doing enough to make sure the new EV mm -hmm. and battery jobs are union and pay, you know, similar wages to the rest of the industry. So that's one of the big fights. But, um, you know, not everybody is happy about workers trying to claim a little bit of power, a little bit of better wages, benefits, et cetera. Over on uh, Bloomberg News, they were live from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and it's very beautiful, uh, lovely surrounding that they're there, kind of freaking out about this potential strike and what is going on with, with the workforce. Let's take a listen. We've had the pay rises. We've had the union action. We haven't had the strikes. Exactly. And I don't think anyone wants to see those strikes anytime soon either. Which has transmitted into this belief that labor has the upper hand. And that if labor has the upper hand, price increases can continue not just union jobs, but more broadly. And that is the key question here. Is that going to continue so that you see a longer right. and higher inflation and a stronger and better economy for even with the rates that we see right now? So it's time for the surveillance extrapolation. We do this every year at Jackson Hole. <laughs> John, I, I'm trying to envision you, brown shorts, working your butt off at UPS, popping 170 all in. That's so never going to happen, we just to be John, very clear. Why not? Why are you talking down the potential for this to happen? If we put John... Even our next guest is laughing. Exactly. Okay. Yes, John, exactly. Lisa, if we put John at Flint, Michigan, building Buicks, uh -huh. what are you going to pop, 225? Not sure. you got to pay an okay. auto worker more you know than what? a guy delivering boxes. I they cannot believe that mm -hmm. these workers are actually earning decent salaries. They think only people like them deserve to earn, you know, living, uh, able to afford like a house and a middle class life, et cetera. But, you know, the thing I love about those clips when we played some of the ones with uh, Kramer freaking out mm -hmm. over on CNBC is just like, this has never happened in my life where they actually feel worried that there is some countervailing force on the other side, and it is a remarkable thing to behold. I think what happened is, is that we had a massive oversaturation of white collar workers, is that obviously with the student debt crisis, and then you have an entire generation of people who wake up and you're like, wait, I don't actually make all that much money. And especially whenever it keeps up with the inf real inflation, not just inflation cost of goods, but the necessary inflation for shelter. And then you combine mortgage rates. And then you have to look at like, what are people actually paying for? What's genuinely valued? At the end of the day, it's about capitalism. And in our system, what we are finding is that the service sector in general, we've squeezed as um, not as much as we can, but a lot of what we have already to get the gains. But we've forgotten so much about all this necessary part of our economy, the blue collar workforce. And then they, using their ability in order to extract concessions, are like, yeah, we actually want to get paid. You relied on us all throughout COVID. We're not just going to sit here and we're not going to take it anymore. It turns out AI is more of a threat for the lawyer than it is for the driver. Yeah. And so in that scenario, it's like, you know, I, I'll, I won't say it in the uh, in a crass way uh, from Goodfellas, like, screw you, pay me. You know, it's like, I, I've got you. And why shouldn't they? So it does annoy me, you know, the way they're talking like, oh, pulling 
225 an hour, there's no way, all of that. First of all, it's not true. Uh, but second, you know, it's one of those where it's like, well, okay, well, what's wrong with that? Like, why is that bad? Right. Why, why, why is it bad, though? Well, are you saying that the, the bow tied guy sitting in Jackson Hole? I really think a lot of it is class anxiety. They're just oh. mad at the idea that these people will actually get paid even close to some of them or their kids who yes. are, you know, majors, something useless in college, and we're banking on some like, you know, upper middle class ish type job, which is just not paying out the same way that it used to. Yeah, I yeah. think I think the class anxiety part of this is very real, and the class discontent. Like they just don't think. Like none of those people could do the the package delivery yeah, exactly, job. Exactly right. None of them could do it. I couldn't do it. That is a freaking hard job. Those men and women are working their asses off, and it is brutal, and it is hard on your hard on your body. And they are actually providing a service that every one of us depends on. And uh, so to have this like sneering contempt about them earning a decent wage and being able to potentially, possibly, maybe, sometime in their life, afford a house, and that they think that that is so undeserved. Meanwhile, you know, they don't think twice about the multi-million dollar mm -hmm. salaries that they're raking in, like sitting in a studio, or flying to Jackson Hole and opining for the world on their thoughts on, you know, the business world from on high. They don't think twice about that, but when it's people who are actually making the economy work, building cars, delivering packages, et cetera, it's nothing but sneers and nothing yep. but contempt. That's right. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.